my name is Cole Anderson. Welcome back to my channel, The Independent Pianist. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about something that I get asked about a lot, which is piano technique. In particular, exercises for the piano. This, of course, is a highly loaded topic, since every great pianist has their own opinions about exercises and their merits. Piano exercises as we know of them nowadays are really typified by the exercises from the 19th century. So exercises by Hannon, Czerny, Clementi, Brahms, Tausig, and so forth. Uh, this they really came into vogue in the 19th century, particularly towards the middle of the century, and have terrorized generations of music students ever since. And this was simply because of the enormous technical demands that were beginning to be placed on pianists. Pianists and teachers were looking for ways to easily codify the technical difficulties of the instrument and simplify the route that was necessary to master its intricacies. Now there's two ways that musicians focused on technical training to reach this end. One way was to compose actual pieces, uh, generally called etudes, that besides being wonderful music, hopefully would also tackle some kind of discrete technical problem. These include the etudes of Cromer, Clementi, and Cherry, many of which are musically wonderful in their own right, all the way up the scale of artistry to masterworks in the form by Chopin and Liszt. Even a work like Schumann's Toccata is really just another kind of etude. Uh, but then we also see collections of purely mechanical exercises that you would never hear performed in a concert. So these are little exercises where a technical difficulty is distilled to its purest form. So foremost among these we have the perhaps undeservedly popular Hannon book as well as the much more elaborate and interesting exercises from artists like Brahms, Tausig, uh, Raphael Josephi, uh, Franz Liszt, Erno Dognani, Alfred Corto, the list goes on and on. And it's chiefly about these sorts of exercises that I'm dealing with now because I'm often asked to what degree are these sorts of exercises useful? Uh, how often should they be practiced? Should they be practiced at all? And you'll hear all kinds of answers. Some will say no, never, never work on those exercises. Others will say yes, all the time. There are some pianists who are absolutely obsessed with working on their scales and exercises constantly. I fall rather more in between these extremes. Uh, personally, I think that great technique is much more effectively created from study of the repertoire. And not only etudes, but also from ambitious large-scale works that combine many different textures and techniques. And this belief has really just been fostered by my own experience with studying the piano. I've practiced many exercises, I've practiced a lot of repertoire, and I've always found that it's particularly the really ambitious large-scale works that have really caused my technique to grow enormously, much more than any exercise. However, at the same time, I think it can be extremely useful to practice some exercises sometimes. And there are a few in particular from that pantheon that I just listed that I have found to be remarkably useful. But for me, I really stress quality over quantity in this area. Picking a few exercises and becoming really great at them is far more useful than slogging through endless pages of dual mechanical exercises that you don't actually master very well. And again, in the last analysis, I do think that repertoire uh, has the best source for exercises. So adapting repertoire to make exercises is a very useful technique, which I'll go into in a little bit here. And first off, there's the obvious benefit to be gained from studying all of the major and minor scales. Uh, this is not only a physical benefit, but also it's enormously beneficial from a theoretical point of view as well. A thorough knowledge of all the scales makes it possible to feel at home in any key instantly. But when it comes to endlessly repeating scales once they are second nature, I rather tend to sympathize with Robert Schumann's point of view. He said something like, repeating your scales every day, trying to play them faster and faster. It's kind of like a scholar trying to become more learned by repeating the alphabet every day faster and faster. It's a little bit pointless if carried to excess, notwithstanding the obvious benefits. So here are my top three or four exercises that I recommend every pianist to at least learn 
and they're well worth revisiting from time to time as well to kind of mark your progress as you develop your technique on the instrument. These are of course accepting all the basic scale exercises as well as scales and double thirds, which I think are very useful. Uh, I'll outline those in another video sometime. So first we have a very simple one, a finger independence exercise, which is usually taught to beginners in this manner. prefer to practice and teach in this way using a diminished seventh chord. And you can really get quite nastily inventive uh, with how you com come up with finger combinations here. Uh, really, the more crazy and mind-bending, the better. Uh, just be sure that every finger that is not playing is held down firmly. So a word of caution, this exercise should not be overdone. It can be dangerous if you do it for too long a period of time at one sitting. Uh, this is merely a way to begin to develop a feeling for independence of the fingers, which of course is most fully developed by the study of contrapuntal music. For example, the fugues of Bach and Handel would be excellent ways of developing this kind of finger independence as well. But I found that it's helpful to study this separate from the music as well. So next, as a kind of extension of this idea, I also like the famous Tausig exercise. Uh, Karl Tausig was one of the greatest of Liszt students, of course, a miraculously talented pianist, although tragically short-lived. Uh, this exercise is found in Tausig's book of exercises, although apparently Brahms also devised something similar on his own, and there was some kind of legal battle over who was the true author. At any rate, whether it came from Tausig or Brahms, it's a marvelously useful and effective technical exercise which I can't recommend enough. For best results, practice it staccato as well as legato and at all dynamics from pianissimo to fortissimo. so don't overdo it, but this would be a very useful exercise to practice on a daily basis until you really feel that you've mastered it. Another marvelous exercise is this one by the wonderful Russian virtuoso uh, Yosef Levin. Uh, this exercise is basically a combination of exercises that already existed, the, this chromatic scale exercise that appears in different forms in both Brahms's and Tausig's exercise books. In Tausig's, it looks like this. he combined this very close kind of technique with an expanded arpeggio, 
uh, kind of in the style of Chopin's Opus 10 Number 1. And the result is a lovely contraction expansion exercise, which really gets your fingers working beautifully. <laughs> Again, you want to practice it staccato as well as legato and with different dynamics and speeds to get the full effectiveness of it. So beyond those basic exercises, I really think that most of the best kinds of exercises can be developed from the repertoire. And to do this, I like to use two techniques. First off, I take difficult passages for one hand and then I double them in both hands. And then secondly, I like to apply something called symmetrical inversion to the result. I mentioned symmetrical inversion before on this channel. If you've seen my video on Rautavara's etudes, uh, Rautavara used this technique in those pieces. Other than that, though, it's very rare actually to find a composer who uses symmetrical inversion in real music. But to recap briefly, uh, the piano is symmetrically constructed around both D and A flat meaning that the pattern of white and black notes is exactly mirrored around the centers. So this is extremely useful from the perspective of equally developing both hands. Uh, since usually, especially in Romantic era repertoire, there's a huge amount of emphasis placed on the right hand. Uh, so let me show you how I would do this. For example, uh, there's a passage from Chopin's Etude Opus 10 Number 2. It's famously difficult, it's one of the most difficult passages in any repertoire. Then, to get the full exercise for the left hand, I symmetrically invert this original material, and then again double the inversion in both hands. So you might wonder, why don't I simply practice with both hands in symmetrical inversion like this? Well, the reason is twofold, actually. It's that um, practicing directly in symmetrical inversion is very useful for developing relaxation and ease in your technique, but it doesn't really transfer into the technique needed in practical situations in the repertoire very well because usually we just don't have the luxury of playing material where the inversion is exactly mirrored in both hands. In fact, usually the most difficult and exposed passages in repertoire are when both hands are doubling at the octave. It's extremely difficult to play unison passages cleanly and clearly because of the awkwardness of having to constantly match weaker fingers with stronger ones when you're playing in unison. That's why I usually find that doublings at the octave are the most useful for developing technique. Now, obviously these kinds of exercises are very mechanical in nature, and there's a whole other aspect to technique which is arguably even more important. I mean, you have to have this mechanical basis firmly in position, but beyond that you also have to know how to handle yourself in a more practical kind of application of technique, where it intersects with the music. There are an endless number of small details about interpretation, timing, accentuation, and so forth which go into a successful accurate performance of the music. It's also really necessary to, to develop a clear mental image 
of what you're going to do on the keyboard. If you can hear what you're going to create with great clarity in your mind, that simplifies the technical difficulty enormously. Many technical problems can be entirely solved just by thinking about them in a different way. And these kinds of instincts can only really be developed under the instruction of an experienced teacher. So if you are a really ambitious pianist and you're looking for someone to help you further your mastery of the instrument, please do consider studying with me. I do accept students online. You can just drop me an email at cole at independentpianist.com and we can set up a consultation. I cover all aspects of interpretation and technique, including theoretical ideas. I think it's really important to have a strong grasp of theory uh, to truly understand the music that you're playing. Uh, if you can truly understand the music you're playing, then it's far easier to master it, particularly if you're trying to play by memory. So thank you again to all of my financial supporters as well. I really appreciate your support. If you haven't already made a donation to support the channel, I encourage you to do so. You can go to www.patreon.com forward slash independent pianist to do so, or feel free to click on my PayPal link in the description box to make a one-time donation. So thanks again for watching and see you next week for some more great piano music.